usually we're focusing, and we'll talk when we get to the literature review, we usually try and focus in the last five, ten years. We try to be as up to date as possible. But um, we do also have to show the history of the ideas that build into it. Um, so is it current? Is it significant? So a lot of us, and where are my health science students? I, li I love health science students, but they like to write a lot. And they sometimes write a medical textbook. All right, your proposal and your thesis can't be a textbook. It can't be everything that is known that is absolutely relevant to your topic. It must only be to make an argument for your topic, to show why what you are doing is significant and needed. Okay, it's not a textbook. It's not an undergraduate textbook. So is it significant? Anything else that we can add about content? Should be concise. Aha! Is the information to the point? <laughs> yes. What else? Context. Context. Aha! Does the information provide sufficient context for understanding. That one is a really important one. Because so, but it's got to provide just enough context for understanding, not too much. A really good idea with this, and why I say that when you're looking at your writing, it must be inward and outward. A really good idea is when you're dotting down the con the, the information, the context. You might want to go and sit with your supervisor or a colleague in the same area and talk them through and explain what you're going to write and then say, am I giving enough information, enough content or context so people can understand it? So that's really why that sitting down and talking through the dot points and the ideas is so important. Okay, so with the content slide, let's look at that one. Let's think at the composition stage. You are writing your content at the composition stage. How do you make sure that your content is good? And that's not immediately writing the sentences. How, before you get to the sentence, are you going to make sure that your content is good? Yes? Okay, how are you going to get those ideas sorted? Yeah, that's a really good idea, to get all those ideas sorted. And one of the big problems that we have is when we start with the reading for the literature review. So, you often know what you want to say about your data, but when we're at the literature review or the methodology, we're stuck. So we're gonna just quickly jump into the content of the literature review, and how do I organize and get myself going? I always say one important thing with your literature review is to decide, first of all, what are you going to read? And what are you going to take notes of? Because sometimes we are so greedy and we're just reading and reading and reading and getting lost in a morass of papers and files. What do we do? So my good idea is number one, this is like a flow chart, but I'm not good at drawing flow charts. So we say yes or no, move on to the next one. So the first one is, is it a core reading? You need to decide something that you're going to read. Is it a core reading, a reading that you absolutely, absolutely must read? How do you know it's a core reading? Any ideas? How do you know it's a must read? Yes. If it's, if it's relevant to your topic. OK, so it might be exactly on your topic. That's important, especially for the cross-disciplinary people. Often, like in my field of education, you're jumping people using different terms, different language for the same thing, and it's quite confusing to know, is it exactly on my topic? Okay, 
Um, how else do I know it's a core reading? Keywords. The keywords might be exactly the same as my keywords, but again, sometimes there's a whole lot of other keywords. It could be your supervisor has said this is absolutely the best important reading. It could be this is the one that everybody is citing. I call it the grandfather text or the grandmother text that everybody talks about this one. You see it in everybody's reference list. Then you know it's a core reading. Okay, so you know it's really important. Now, in a PhD thesis, how many references do you think you might have in your, in your bibliography at the back? 200. 200, okay. I had 3,000, I think, over 3,000. <laughs> but my was very cross-disciplinary. So then I was, had to read so much. But it's going to be a lot. Um, but of those 3,000, maybe 50 were core texts. The others were just tangential, not so important. So, if it's a core reading, you must take notes of everything. But the key thing when we take notes is we need to separate the English from the content. Because otherwise, what we do is we plagiarize. Even if we don't mean to, we plagiarize because we are keeping those precious words of the author. And some of us are really good, have good memories. And we remember it even if we didn't write it down, and then you find, oops, I've plagiarized. <laughs> so if you take really good notes where you're separating the English from the content, the discipline language is very clear. If it's a direct quote, you're putting the quotation there. You know all of that. Then in your notes, you're not going to plagiarize. And then you put it in their own words as well, as much as possible. Okay, so if it's a core reading, everything is important. But usually it's not. For three quarters, seven eighths of your articles, there won't be a core reading. So you don't have to read everything. Then the next question is, do I need this article at all? And sometimes, from the title, you're not sure. So then you go and read the abstract. But stop, if the abstract you are uncertain, Discard it. Don't waste your time. If you've got to read 3,000 texts, you're not going to finish it all. So if it's not important, discard. If it is, then take down the bibliographic information. Mm -hmm. And as soon as possible, if you think it's relevant at all to your topic, get it into Mandalay or get it into EndNote or Zotoro or whatever bibliographic software you are using. Then, Skim read as in the next question. So then you decide for yourself which sections do I need to read and take notes of. Now often when we're talking about the same topic, everybody, and we'll, when we look at discourse a little bit later, everyone has the same story in an introduction. Everyone's introduction is using different words but saying the same story. So why do you need to take notes of every article's introduction? You're wasting your time. Right, but what is it in that article that is important? Okay, and only take those notes. So which sections do I need to read? If you're not sure, read the abstract and the first sentence of every paragraph. And then you can see, hmm, if it's interesting, then highlight it. Don't be like Michelle, I used to be the highlight queen. <laughs> highlight, 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 highlight. Then I go back and I highlight, highlight, then I take notes. Oh, and I still haven't, it takes me three reads before I've actually got a set of notes. No, use the highlighter to show which sections you're going to read and then take notes as soon as possible. All right, or else you like me, I was in the Emirates working and I sent my all my notes in a suitcase and my suitcase got lost oh. <laughs> in the middle of my PhD. Yes, so I am no longer the highlight queen. I'm now the note queen. I take notes <laughs> very quickly. Okay, and keep them electronically and store them in many places. Okay, then which sections do I need to read? If I'm sure, read only the abstract and the relevant section and take notes. What do I need to read within the sections? Only that that relates to my research focus, and that's what I take notes on. 
If you're sure, you read that and you take notes of it. If you're not sure, you take notes of the whole section. But all the time, try to separate the English from the content. Is this an English word or is this a content word? And if it's a content word, I might keep it. Now, those of you in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, you do not actually quote. So there's no point in writing down quotations because you're not allowed to do it. You can take down disciplinary phrases, and we're going to look at disciplinary phrases and how they reoccur without plagiarizing. If you're in the humanities, art, social sciences, public health, you are allowed to quote. Psychology, you are allowed to quote. But don't be the quote king or queen. Don't take masses and masses and masses of quotes because it's just English. If that quote needs to be special, it needs to have some significant meaning and it can't be said in another way, then keep it. If not, why are you quoting? this huge chunk. Anyone in law here? No. That's the only discipline where you have to have the exact words or it means something different. Okay. All right. And if, it's a, if it is a, a, an act or a law that you're quoting from, then you'll give the exact words. But otherwise, is that phrase very, very special? Then you need to quote it. But we overquote. We use quotes unnecessarily. Okay, what do I need to do with my notes? Now, this is the other magic of Mandalay, the magic of EndNotes and other bibliographic software. Once you are in it and you've downloaded the article bibliographic details, you can do it directly from the library. You don't even have to type it all in. It puts it into the bibliographic software for you. And then, once it's in the bibliographic software, mine is EndNotes, but Mandalay works the same way. You can actually group or categorize your notes. So you can categorize your bibliographic software and the notes that you've taken for each article in various ways. So I can maybe categorize it. I'm going to use these five articles in the method section. So you can categorize them according to the section of your thesis. Like this, you add the references to and you make a new group. Go to the Mandalay workshop, they will show you how to do it. Okay, you can make a group and you can categorize it. Then, when you want to write about that topic or that section of your document, you can just go and have output style that selects all the information in that section. You can choose select all, all sections, and you can then read just the notes and the bibliographic software, maybe three or four pages of notes, instead of having to go back to the thick articles. Mm -hmm. Masses and masses of thick articles. You can read three or four pages of notes. You can dot point your ideas down. Number one, you won't plagiarize. Number two, you're keeping the content together and you're making sure that your content is all fits together and tells one clear story. It's a wonderful, magical thing using bibliographic software. Or some people do it another way. This is a student, you can't see all the details, but this was one student of mine in, who I was working with in his writing. He was a science student, and this was his literature review one year into his thesis. Every time he read something, he added the notes to this mind map. Okay, and he made this, this is free software. There's a whole lot of software you can get, mind mapping software um, through the web. Okay, so he added it. I had another student who did it in a scruffy paper Thing on his wall and he added and scribbled on his wall and he had this huge mind map all across his wall so whatever suits you but what you're doing is you're taking the literature and you're putting a shape to it it stops you plagiarizing and you can make sure that your content is accurate relevant up to date 
because you're constantly checking and adding to it. With your literature review, you should, once you've got your keywords, as you suggested, you've got to get those keywords and you've got to find all the keywords. Because sometimes, I'll tell you a secret with me, one of my areas of research is postgraduate supervision. How to teach supervisors to be good supervisors. When I started in that area, I used that keyword postgraduate supervision. And there weren't many papers. And I thought, oh, how good am I? There's nothing related to my topic until I realized the Americans call it graduate supervision. <laughs> Everybody has a different terminology. So yes, you've got to find all the relevant keywords. And then throughout your dissertation, every month, or thesis, every month, do another keyword search in all the databases that you are looking for. Okay, do a keyword search every month because papers are arriving all the time. And you don't want to be the idiot in the end. So my PhD, I was just about to hand in one week, and my supervisor said to me, Michelle, you have to read this book, 300 pages, or else you will look stupid, you don't understand the topic. It's just arrived, this book. <laughs> I have to admit, I didn't read the whole book. <laughs> I read the first sentence of everything, and I saw where do I need to read, and I only read the relevant bits. <laughs> but I did read it. So you've got to constantly be checking to make sure that you're completely up to date with your literature. And then you can categorize it and fit it into the relevant category. But you've already got the skeleton, and you can just add the meat of all the categories. So always think of categorizing your literature. So at the composition stage, your role is to, first of all, read and to disentangle all the bits and put it in your categories. And then when you're writing it, you have to weave it together again. And if you've categorized or mind mapped all your literature, it's so much easier to do that. Okay.